welcome to the latest issue of the Blue Sky Fostering Podcast. I don't know how many we've done. Um, I can't count past 10 on a lot of occasions. I think this is like 27 or 28. Um, we started it at the start of lockdown, probably about two weeks in with um, Helen, who was one of our clinical practitioners here and her daughter. Um, and we talked about um, autism and we've gone through a whole range of things since then, which I won't bore you with now. But today um, we are joined by, as you can see somewhere on the screen, um, Ian. Um, who we have pretty much the same hairstyle, which we quite we first noticed when we first met each other online. Ian's is a little bit more cultured than mine. Um, so today we're really, really lucky to be joined by Ian, um, who's going to be running some training for us at Blue Sky in the not too distant future. Um, I'm not going to introduce him because that's the whole point of this podcast and this little video is to find out more about him um, and maybe spread some learning along the way. So hello, mate. <laughs> hello, Ed. All right. Thanks for having me on your podcast channel at Blue Sky. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, my name's Ian Thomas. I'm a former looked after child. I am a recovering drug addict. Um, I'm an advocate for change that anybody can change who is experiencing challenges within their lives. And I'm also now a qualified social worker. I've spent probably over 10 years now working in the UK foster care sector sector. With experience of child protection, child safeguarding, um, and international development, supporting countries on low to middle income countries to get fostering off the ground, um, and loads and bits and bobs in between public speaking, TEDx, and TV appearances, and bits and bobs, and in my mission to advocate and and you know, um, yeah, that change is possible, and and you know, to try and evoke more of a compassionate response to human adversity which I think is needed. <laughs> um, it is, mate. And I think that um, one of the, me, me and Ian have only met um, once on here before we've spoken over email a little bit, but you get a feeling from people when you talk to them that they're on the same wavelength as you in terms yeah. of their um, ethics and, and ways of working and stuff. And that's why I was so keen to get you on here, mate, because I feel like um, there's just something that I want to get out to more people the conversations that we had when we met a couple of weeks ago and yeah. I want to start that off and obviously you were talking about we we haven't got any pre-planned questions I've not told you what we're going to talk about really so um my, I'm going to try and catch you out um no so my, my first like being in a police station is not a completely <laughs> new experience for me well mate it's funny that you say that because my first question is you recently ran some training for some prison officers didn't you I did so tell me about it. What was that like? Obviously now, I was going to say being on the other side, obviously you talked briefly a minute ago about um, being in the uh, criminal justice system when you were younger. So we'll come to that later, but what was it like yeah, training yeah. Police, um, police off, um, prison staff, sorry. Yeah, yeah, prison staff. So, I mean, prison staff have a really uh, underrated job and it's a really important job. Um, and, and I think that they are, you know, supporting because that's their role, it, it, you know, some of society's most um, vulnerable people. And, and, and I choose the word vulnerable because I think that sometimes, you know, more often than not, that, that you know, criminality is a symptom of vulnerability, right? And it's a group of extremely marginalised people. So the work they do is really important. And um, I don't know if you knew this, Ed, but there's about 85,000 people in prison at any given time. Um, I don't know the exact data right now, but it's around that figure. 27% of that prison population that we know of are former looked after children. Mm. And I think to, to just kind of like deconstruct that idea a little bit. So I think that um, that data I don't know is entirely reliable because, um, you know, let's face it, when we get that data, it's normally sending white middle class people into prisons and, and trying to engage people who are very disenfranchised, probably a little bit anti-establishment at the best of times and 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 the sample i don't think was big enough to ascertain you know the true figures but as somebody that spent you know uh, over three years in prison and 10 prison sentences sorry six prison sentences over 10 prisons around the south coast of england i reckon it's at least half the prison population of former looked after children so there's a real push at the moment thank god from uh, central government and some national leads to look at how are we supporting care leavers in prison? Because there's so many there. And, and you know, it's not a coincidence that they're overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And part of that is um, I've been lucky enough to, uh, through the Reese Foundation, to be the person that has written the workshop and, and deliver it to prison staff. 
and it just kind of looks at you know what is the reality of a young person from 18 to 25 and beyond who has been in care what are the pathways that might have led them there and some of the challenges that they're experiencing leading up to going in prison and coming out and how you know the added vulnerabilities really because being in prison isn't a nice bit isn't a nice thing <laughs> yeah i mean you wouldn't think i thought that because i went back quite a few times and i think i enjoyed yeah, it a repeat customer <laughs> yeah, yeah who says crime don't pay you know <laughs> but so, um well that's gonna be i'll just I'm sorry to talk about obviously you're talking about the vulnerabilities and the specifics i think as well um just to kind of flip back even slightly more is when you look at the homeless population and actually the, the 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 amount of figures that are thrown around of them coming through the care system most people the people being homeless coming through the care system and there seems to be that fail, there's a failing somewhere there's something isn't right that it those two populations of people are made up through care leave is a system that supports people when they're younger and when obviously one of the things when you come out of prison one of the things is having a network around you isn't it to stop you reoffending yeah. And do you think, therefore, that that maybe leads to the reoffending of care leavers, potentially? Basically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that care leaver is. I think last time I read up on the data, I think it was um, the Laming Review in 2016 said I think they're 35 times more likely to reoffend. That is, you know, like huge. So they're the highest group of reoffenders. Um, and 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 I just let's do something around the language reoffending or in conflict with the law, right? You know, and, and, and if you take children in care and then children that aren't in care, a child in care is six times more likely, six and a half times more likely to engage in the criminal justice system. So there's a strong relationship between being in care and engaging in the criminal justice system. And I think that that's around practice issues, philosophy and sort of a legalistic clinical response to trauma rather than a trauma informed approach, which is what fostering is all about. Right. And in, in, in modern day foster care um, and I think for me you know I left care at a huge socio-economic uh, disadvantage and you know my social capital you know I was scraping the bottom of the barrel as it was and then when you send someone to prison you reject them from society which often confirms the negative belief systems they carry about themselves because the belief systems that we have as human beings are the engine that drives our behavior our philosophies our ideas how we interpret the world around us and, and, and then what you do is you starve people of social capital and let them out with less social capital than when they went in because they've been rejected and disconnected from society. And it just kind of like bridges, like, it, 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 you know, it amplifies the sort of what was already a, a big gap even more. So, you know, it's just some basic things. And, and generally speaking, out of all the times I've been in prison, People behave, they go in their cells, they eat their dinners, they go to their showers, they do the exercise yard and their education. Yes, there are drug cultures and violence and all those things, but generally speaking, people do as they're told. And I don't think that's a coincidence either. And I think that that's got something to do with their basic human fundamental needs being met. Mm. And when people are released from prison, often there's not education in place or employment or training, there's you know, not secure accommodation, um, lack of money and, and you know any criminologist or you know, half interested person would tell you that there's strong links between poverty and crime. So, you know, I think that they're just sort of some of the headlines of the challenges that, you know, care leavers can, can face. And, you know, if we just take the 27% of the 85,000, well, it costs £119,000 to send someone to prison from the point they become in conflict with the law to the minute they get behind the prison door. And it costs about £40,000 a year to incarcerate someone for 12 months. Now, if we just take that £40,000 a year and we take the 27% of the 85000 we're spending over £918 million a year to incarcerate former looked after children. So we're contending with some very unsophisticated economic philosophies here, you know, and, and so even for like the neoliberal policy writers who, who are kind of looking at it from a poor economic perspective, there is scope for, um, you know, a, a financial analysis, you know, that's before you even start thinking that you care about people, which I think should be our motivating factor. So, you know, I think there's some work to be done here from so many angles and it's in everybody's interest. And I think everyone's got a role to play in with that. When you look at the foster care system, whether that's the professionals working with people through to the carers, through to any teachers, anybody that's having an interaction with young people at some stage on their journey, there's a role to play, isn't there? 
Um, yeah, yeah, and so yeah, when, yeah. when when you were younger then, um, to, yeah. to kind of throw things back, when you were younger, what, if we maybe start with maybe actions of people that were helpful to start off with. So what was obviously, you know, like you said, you spent time in prison as you, when you got, became a care leaver, but was there anything along that way that was helpful that kind of maybe made, helped make you the person that you are now? Because you're not in prison now, you're in your beautiful van, you know, traveling around yeah. there. So what yeah, was yeah, yeah. stuff? You. Yeah, we should probably just validate the beautiful van comment because I'm not sure we've said that yet. No. So, yeah, for those listeners and watchers out there, <laughs> I'm reporting live from the Peak District uh, in my van. Uh, this is my home. I, I live in a mobile home, a converted van. I am a free spirit. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm one with nature, I hope. So, so yeah, this, this is, that's the, the, the context. Indeed. Maybe we'll come back to that because I think that's got, I think there's a real interesting conversation there about, um, having like a home and and being yeah. like, at peace with yourself yeah because you know, when you just said uh, in a van i'm thinking they'll think their listeners will be thinking bloody hell he's homeless i thought he'd rehabilitated <laughs> or something <laughs> yeah yeah of course you pinned him down yeah and he's, an, he's, he's a, got a, homeless people on a podcast <laughs> they must be desperate <laughs> <laughs> scraping the barrel but i think there's something to be said about it because when when we first met you're this like aura of a person who is just confident and calm and composed mm. to have read and to have talked to to know what you've gone through mate that's that's that seems to be one hell of a transformation and uh, you know i think that's obviously testament to your um your drive um so yeah to go back to that then what was helpful when you were younger that's now led you yeah. to your van rather than being you know somewhere else yeah 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 um what was helpful i mean uh, you know I, People I, it's the people I remember mm. engaging with. You know, I remember I had a good social worker called Steve uh, and he was interesting and interested, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and he was able to engage me and and, and I spent time with him and, and, ine and inevitably you would have been undertaking assessments in terms of where I was at, what was going on. Were you aware on. of that at the time? No. No, I mean, I've sat in front of IROs before who are completing forms and it's been clear that they are doing an assessment, um, you know, but, but his was, well, they call it the exchange model in social work education. The exchange model is a favoured model, um, you know, because it's kind of like you're, you're engaging in an exchange, you know, it's like more of a conversation, you know, um, rather than a tick box exercise. Yeah. And so I think that was helpful. And, and you know what, I, I kind of knew you were going to ask a question like this to me. And I have quite a specific memory of uh, Simon uh, Lockyer. Uh, and I remember um, it was at a previous agency in the 90s, late 90s. And I was at a school and there was three pupils at this school and a good few staff members. And if a fire extinguisher didn't get set off or a fire alarm one day, they'd have a touch, you know. And, and, and I think that um, what was good about that school was it, it considered how to engage us, you know, and it was about working with us and where we were at within our own development rather than kind of, you know, schools very much. This is the school's agenda, KPIs, da, 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 and you've got to meet us here. But, but the role reversed with this school that Simon and, and his colleagues had set up. It was about, OK, well, these kids need to be in education it's not working for them in mainstream. So what can we do? And it's like, let's build it around them. We obviously know we've got to meet certain learning outcomes. And, and, and I know more about that process now in terms of my capacity to articulate it to you than I did then. I wasn't thinking like <laughs> yeah. this then. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they're meeting me where I'm at. You know? <laughs> Christ, you know, kid. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have that intellectual inquiry, I tell you, you know what I mean? I was consistently compulsively reacting to my negative feelings and it, it wasn't a walk in the park, you know? So it, it's, uh, yeah, but I remember a specific time and Simon was a director at the time. And I had this thing that I didn't want to grow up and be a man because I had ideas about how men behaved in terms of the abusive household that I lived in and, and it frightened me. And, and, and sometimes I used to get really worried as a child thinking I've got to be a man and I've got to be an adult and I just used to feel really overwhelmed with worry and 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 I think this one day I wasn't really engaging in the process and I was sort of sat on the bottom stairs sulking really and just sort of being quite unhappy and and I remember Simon took the time out to come and sit next to me and he was trying to engage me you know and and I, I, 
and I know that looking back, you know, my 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 you know self preservation and and my ego had constructed itself in a way to kind of like shut him off and you know like not let anyone in and you know and and I remember um, him trying to engage with me, but but and I knew beyond my own coping strategies that that he was being kind and nice and he wanted to contribute to my development in some way and so I remember I sat on the stairs with Simon and and uh, and around that time I had written him a letter and asked him for a BMX because you know I've lived on the Isle of Wight and all my friends or the new friend I've made had BMXs and I wanted to be able to join in and 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 you know Simon arranged that for me and I was able to then sort of have a new interest a hobby and and, and out on my BMX, I didn't want to smoke weed anymore. You know, I, I didn't want to be puffing in the bike sheds with the kids, although I had a bike, you know. I, I wanted to go down the ramps and Pool Park and, and, and join those kind of kids, you know, and, and do stuff and get exercise and sleep better and eat better and be out enjoying what, you know. And I think that that was probably some of the best times of my childhood at the age of sort of 12, 13, Um before kind of addiction sort of creeped back up really and, 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 and kind of took me hostage. And, and, you know, and I think other things that helped was, you know, just people giving me time. I think, you know, the time is probably the most valuable thing you can give anyone. Right, so what's you can get it back, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can chuck 20 quid at someone and say, go and get yourself a burger or a pack of fags. Probably not. But, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, you know, you just can't get that back. No. And I think that children are very intuitive and, and, you know, you store everything, right. And, and, and you remember it and, and, and children have had to navigate abusive situations and a lot of dysfunctional relationships. And as a result of that, you become more intuitive, whether you're presenting that you're intuitive or not, you are in my opinion. And also when you're in like um, when you're in that sort of survival mode as well, do you know what I mean? You are you are heightened to think, right, what do I need to do to 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 to, to stay alive, really, isn't it? And actually trying to seek out those yeah. things. And, and when you just mentioned the addiction word um, and you said hostage as well, um, how yeah. as you've as you've got older and reflect on that, was there a key turning point, you think, that that led you down that path? Was there something that you went and obviously you don't suddenly go. Well, I wasn't doing drugs yesterday and now I am. And now all of a sudden I'm here. It's what was, what was the kind of the driver for yeah. that? You feel? Yeah. Trauma, mm -hmm. trauma massively. Um, you know, and I think it's probably good to, to sort of dispel some myths about addiction and, and particularly substance, you know, misuse. So it, it's a myth that drugs are addictive. That's not true because addiction is more than a physical dependency on a substance. Um, you know, and, and if drugs were addictive, then anyone who ever took a drug would be a drug addict. It's a bit like if alcohol was the problem, then anyone who ever took a drink would be an alcoholic. And I trust that most people listening to this aren't alcoholics. I bloody hope not if you're fostering, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> but but um, and if you are, we can help you too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and I, yeah, yeah. And, and the other myth is that it's like a choice, like a moral deficiency or, a, mm. you know, an ethical dilemma. That is also not the truth. I think addiction is a multifaceted health issue, you know, that, that has, you know, various components. Um, and the experience of, you know, being an addict is, um, you know, it's about the obsession and obsession of the mind. Um, an obsession is a thought that excludes all other thoughts and then creates a compulsion to act out on that obsession causing endless loops to self-destructive behavior patterns and and you know addiction for me started long before I took a drug mm. and and you know my I can remember as as a very very young child you know looking outside of myself to feel better to self-soothe for assurance or distraction and 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 you know with this hope that there'll be this sort of static accomplishment that if I just get enough sweets cigarettes you know money you know cannabis ecstasy cocaine crack heroin you know the right woman the right car the right motorbike the right van the right holiday the right train ticket plane ticket you know yeah like it, something out there is going to make all of this feel better and 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 what i have learned is that um i was contending with a deep sense of sadness inside of myself that just felt so inconsolable and all my life I was looking for something and I didn't know what I was looking for. 
And when I thought I found it, I'd sabotage it because fear and anxiety of loss and abandonment would overwhelm me and I'd be continuing for compulsion to act out negatively. If you think about the children that we care for, you know, I'm now a social worker and have been heavily involved in fostering and, and trust that some of this audience will as well. You know, the children come to us with a catalogue of experience to suggest that we're going to leave them, let them down, abandon them or hurt them in some way. And, and, and they behave in ways that reflect those experiences they've had. And, and, you know, as human beings, we have experiences as children and, and we develop this way of seeing the world. It's like the blueprint, which is our lens that we look through. And the architectures of that blueprint are our values and our beliefs and ways of thinking where our neurological pathways are hardwired because it's a response to environment. And those belief systems are the engine that drives all that behavior. So I had belief systems that I was unworthy of receiving love, that, you know, I was insignificant and I wasn't important. And, and I behaved in ways to confirm that. So every time a foster placement broke down, it confirmed that negative belief system that I carry about myself. And I would go into the home and I would think to myself, OK, I'm going to be a good, you know, there'd often be a social worker driving me there and there'd be a conversation with the social worker. And I remember this social worker back in the days too, and she'd say, right, Ian, these are new foster carers. They're really down to earth. You've got to behave. Please don't smash the furniture up because that was my MO. You know, and, and I go, all right, I promise I'm going to behave this time. And if you put me up to a lie detector test and say, Ian, are you going to behave? Are you going to try your hardest? I would have said yes and I would have passed the test because I meant it. But I didn't know when, you know, the foster parents would become valuable to me and I'd start to like living there that I'd start to feel insecure and paranoid and collate this catalogue of evidence to suggest that it's all going to go wrong for me. And it would become so overwhelming and it just go and I'd explode, you know, and, and then I'd behave in ways and then people would react to the explosion and I'd react to their reaction. And, and I think sometimes, you know, what we've got to say is, you know, okay, well, little Johnny is, you know, been behaving like this but what's driving that behavior what what's what's let's get behind that what's driving that and and for me you know it, I'd had a set of experiences where I had these belief systems and, and I was frightened and, and felt really sad and I didn't have the intellectual or uh, emotional vocabulary to be able to, to say that or understand it and and sometimes I just felt like I was consistently and you know compulsively reacting to my own pain and it was quite and that was the only way I could tell the world around me that I was hurting right now. And I think the key to fostering and the key to understanding addiction and understanding that, you know, there are sections of our society that are very traumatised. The key to it is recognising that it takes wisdom to see intention, but we are often judged by our actions. And, and fostering is about the wisdom to see intention and, and that somewhere along the line, it's just a child saying, please love me, but I haven't got a clue how to ask for it. So you said, uh, you said, um, you were talking about emotional, um, like the emotional language, of, sorry, emotional vocabulary. There we go. There's my lack of vocabulary mm. coming out there. Um, <laughs> at what point did that start to um, manifest itself that you developed that emotional vocabulary? I mean, again, much like addiction, all of a sudden you just wake up one day and go, oh, there's the words. <laughs> I've got some equanimity and elicro. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, when I was in rehab and to sort of, well, I got into recovery from addiction. So to fast forward the tape a bit, I was in the police station when I was 21. Um, I was about eight stone in weight six foot tall um yeah, you know i had no, no veins left in my arms from intravenous crack and heroin use and i just abandoned the human being within you know and the only thing that was holding me together was denial really this psychological coping strategy designed to keep me emotionally stable in unstable times and and my life was really unstable so my you know my brain had constructed kind of realities that felt more convenient <laughs> you know <laughs> And, and that's also another thing about behavior and habits and addiction is that, you know, people uh, construct realities that they can cope with. And that is a response to trauma. Oh, they shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. But they're just that's how they're surviving, you know. And, and I took that to the extreme, you know, and 
I was in this police station and, and, and this police officer, uh, sorry, this uh, solicitor told me, you know, was, was just sort of run of the mill, really. I was on the conveyor belt of the criminal justice system and I had a bit of an intervention from a solicitor, unwittingly, I think. And, and she told me that she used to have a gin problem, but she doesn't drink anymore. And I could smell gin on her, but that didn't bother me. She was representing me in the police station and, and she gave me advice that I thought was helpful. And, and therefore, I, you know, I, I confided in her a little bit. But something different this time. She started speaking to me with endearing language, like sweetheart, love and darling. And she had this sort of soft look in her eyes that um, conveyed a message of care and compassion. And I remember she said to me, Ian, what are you doing? Why, why are you living like this? And I took this deep breath and I sat back in the chair and I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. And, and I felt the world, weight of the world lift off my shoulders. And, and I think that was probably the most honest admission and thing I'd said in a long, long, long time. You know, uh, that was authenticity. And I think that my vocabulary, you know, being able to speak uh, an emotional vocabulary has come from uh, an authentic desire for change and, and, and a lot of support, you know, and, and, and then that evolved from being sentenced to, you know, going to prison and contending with all of that and then getting into a drug rehabilitation program in one of the prisons through the Forward Trust, the charity set up by Anthony Hopkins to support people incarcerated with addiction, you know, and, and, and then people started, they gave me a sheet of paper that had, you know, feelings on it. It was like a language, so like anger, hurt, you know, sad, lost, lonely, flat, tired, you know, and, and I remember looking through this sort of sheet and thinking, you know, what, what words can I use to describe how I feel? And it was that basic at the beginning, you know, because I couldn't rock up to the breakfast table and say, I feel unworthy of receiving love today, everybody. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that wasn't available for me. You know, it's, I had to kind of like really work from the beginning, you know. <laughs> so um, we were talking about um, like cycles and um, how you develop in a language, um, like an emotional vocabulary, and yeah, how yeah. Obviously that didn't just rock up overnight. Um, and the solicitor, when you threw yourself back in the chair and you just felt like that weight had been lifted off your shoulders. Um, yeah. I think that's probably the moment that a lot of our kids ha have been in. They'd, I've always found with kids that I've worked with and stuff is that there's, there's, just, there's always like, I don't know, I say time slows down, but you think this might be a moment here of like a, a helpful like intervention. And what age were you when she spoke to you? When would you say you were 21? So I was 21, yeah. So I didn't know a great deal really. I just kind of just trying to survive my my difficult feelings and kind of you know my mental health and addiction. And yeah, I was incredibly lost. I had, yeah, and 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 I guess. I think for me, um, what made that sort of so helpful was that she was compassionate and kind. And I think that they need to be characteristics of any intervention when helping people. You know, um, there's a great line in the Tibetan book, Living and Dying, and it says that when compassion is present, then are we able to see the truth? Um, it's a long read, but a good one. And, and, and I just think that, you know, my ego had constructed itself in a way as, you know, to, to, to defence mechanisms. And, and if you'd sort of said to me, oh, Ian, what you're doing, right, throw him away, let, throw, lock him up, throw away the key, you know, reject him from society, you know, demonise, you know, um, I, my ego was ready for that. But if you come at kindness and care and love and warmth, it, there's no defence for love because no defence is needed, you know. What was, um, so you've just mentioned that, what was it called, the, the Tibetan Book of? Living and Dying. Who bought you that? Uh, I, 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 I saw somebody talk about it and I went out and got it myself. Yeah, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. So, it, you know, it, it sort of talks about living and dying and, and you know dying is is important and dying happens every moment every moment dies and every moment is new is born and I think that we live in a materialistic world you know and, and I think that there is a reality beyond the animalistic five senses and and I think that for me I've had to learn how to access that reality 
and and prayer and meditation are just two paradigms in which I'm able to do so. Um, and I think that death is, it's important to ruminate on death and think about death, not a morbid perspective, but to say it's important to have a good death. You know, it's important for us to die willingly. You know, uh, we, we, it's inevitable, right? You know, and, 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 and I think that there's not enough uh, time and attention given to death and suffering. It, it's the same as suffering, isn't it? You know, we must learn to suffer like we must learn to die. Because if I said to you, I mean, it sounds bloody morbid, doesn't it? But, it, you know, in, in one context, but if I said to you, well, we're going to live a life where we never suffer, of course we're going to suffer. So it's important we learn to suffer. Are we going to live a life where we never die? Of course we're going to die. So we must learn to die. And, and, and these are, you know, beautiful things of life. And, and my suffering has taught me some, you know, beautiful lessons and found some... Um, you know, just such meaningful moments of serenity and surrender to processes that I've been resisting for a long, long, long time. And I think that, um, you know, my experiences have been a terrible gift and, and you know, and, and part of, you know, what prolonged my suffering was, was, you know, my resistance to suffering. It's like change, isn't it? You know, uh, when you work in organisational change, I've worked in national roles before, and you know, change is not necessarily that difficult in some respects, but resistance to change is very painful. Mm -hmm. And and whether it's personal development, professional development, or organisational change, like change is inevitable. It's going to happen. It never stays the same. And it's our attachment to, you know, realities that we construct in our head and experiences that we have and people. That, that, that you know make us want to hold on to them and, and not want them to change but but it's the attachment that causes us some pain i'm kind of edging into eastern philosophy now i'm starting to sound like buddha which would be a huge compliment but i'm genuinely not <laughs> you know what um what obviously in change is something that you know we all go through change of some aspect but looked after children in the care system are there's change every day you know a social worker comes they go your foster carers come they go your friendships group comes goes that mm. that's something that you're not in control of at any point and um you do you think now then that stuff like that has allowed you to kind of put those things into some kind of order from your younger life by knowing um i most definitely say yes but but you know because yeah, none of us just arrived here, right? We've all been on a journey, you know? And uh, although sometimes I feel like I've just arrived here because I've got no bloody idea what I'm doing, you know? But, but um, yeah, we've all been on a journey. And, and, and I think that, that, you know, each experience is designed to prepare us, you know, for the next. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, you know? But they normally <laughs> prepare us for the next. And, and, and what I've learned is that, um, you know, if I do the same things, I normally get the same results and I often experience the same things until I'm ready to evolve and move on to a new experience. And, and, and what I promote is often, you know, what I attract. So I think that um, my life has allowed me to, you know, embrace change more. And, 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 you know, and I think sometimes that's a barrier for me feeling settled and, and sometimes it's it's a real liberator for me to go on and experience beautiful things, and and I am uh, you know a work in progress, like I said. And there's parts of my personality that that you know should probably be a bit more grounded in terms of you know sustaining long term relationships, which I do have in my life today. Um, I think the uh, the fast track to spiritual growth is relationships. And, and romantic ones more so. Um, yeah, you're getting me all contemplative now, mate. So what, um, so with, with your, um, what would you say then your, cause I've, you know, sort of, let me talk, if we talk about spirituality and stuff like that and that sort of peace within ourselves and, you know, understanding our brain and, and all those kind of things. Do, do you think that that's something that maybe we should be helping kids to understand more. It doesn't, I mean, I think sometimes people associate spiritual, 
spirituality with having a faith or a religion and obviously that you know for me that isn't always the case um you know whatever people need to use to help kind of navigate through life but do you think that kind of you know the word sort of um uh, mindfulness and stuff is you know thrown around and that's something I've really struggled with I really struggle to be in the moment um I really struggle to be yeah. to be present because you know at the moment there's someone cutting grass outside and that's all I can hear because my senses yeah. are like I've got to be aware of that what is that noise and you know sort of heightened and mm. actually to be present is something that um you've just said you said sitting with death sitting with suffering so yeah is there is there any way that we can get young people to understand I'm not saying we buy them all the Tibetan book <laughs> but how do we kind of bring those things to you know 12 year old Ian yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah. That's a bloody ambitious task, Ed. Uh, <laughs> I'm not spiritual enough to answer that one, you know. Um, but but I guess for me, there's a what there's wider sociological issues that perhaps we could touch on, and then maybe home down to the twelve year old Ian or any child who may be in somebody's care who's listening to this, or any child or any person. I think that um, we are very very much confused on what happiness is you know and i think it's possible to experience pleasure um and be miserable and and people um use the paradigm of pleasure in order to find happiness so happiness is this and pleasure is this and people think if they keep going to pleasure it will lead them to happiness and and pleasure is a positive experience right you know, we denote a positive, you know, when I say it was pleasurable, generally speaking, I'm denoting that that's positive. Now, you know, but but pleasure is sort of dopamine, isn't it? Serotonin and, you know, all the endorphins that, it, you know, the natural opioids in our brain that is released. And we live in a society, you know, where um, that has been commercialized and capitalized on. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I'm not saying it's inherently bad or inherently good, but that is the reality. And, and so every advert, you know, every um, commercial agenda is, is somewhat geared up towards improving our lives by making us feel better. And, and we can't live a life by constantly feeling better because that's not what is meant to happen. And I think that what that does is it promotes lots and lots of opportunity for us to escape and not be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think so what happens is, you know, we develop a, a society that generally just cannot be with itself. So, you know, it's why people say, you know, would I legalize drugs? I, I you know, I, in, as a drug addict who's in recovery, people think that's an interesting question and it is. And I always say, I would decriminalise drugs. I don't know about legalising drugs because we're just promoting more ways for people not to be with themselves. Yeah. So I think the fundamental thing is, is how can people be with themselves? That is the, you know, and, and then how they do that, I think is, is, is very individual. But screen time, you know, is a huge phenomena that, that you know, is, is distracting us all. You know, and, and we design we, we design technology to bring us closer together, but really what it's doing is is pulling us further apart. And I think intimacy, um, you know, again, not in terms of a romantic context, but intimacy is in into me you see. You know, we, we're using sort of virtual platforms, you know, to, to kind of communicate, which is uh, quite an unsophisticated, poor substitution for human connection. And why I say it's unsophisticated, because, you know, the human brain and nonverbal communication and, and intuition and all the things that we do when we talk to each other is very sophisticated, yeah. whether we're fully conscious of it or not. And, and we are using substitutions that are very unsophisticated and, and we lose a lot of that. And I think so our innate, you know, skills and ability to communicate in, in varying ways, um, you know, is being watered down as we go. Uh, through this sort of technological revolution that has now been vastly exhilarated and especially since COVID. So I think that's the wider sociological issue. Then let's throw a bit of trauma into that and, you know, abandonment and rejection, you know, and, and, and then we've got, you know, a real disaster, haven't we? And a recipe for a concoction of, I just need to escape. I can't be with myself. This is painful. And I think that, we can't control how children think. We can't control how children feel. All we can do is to cultivate the environments that are conducive to positive mental health and self-esteem and, and, you know, helping children. 
learn and grow. And, and I think that, you know, when I was in care, there was a very much a, a pretense on that if I'm a good boy, I'll get good experiences. And that wasn't always the case, but there was a strong pretense of that. And I think that is the case for a lot of child, childhoods, you know, and, and it's not. And, and I, I can see why it's not a completely, you know, unrealistic expectation in a lot of senses. But when we're talking about trauma informed care, I, I think, that you know, again, it goes back to wisdom to see intention and actions. Right. And, and I think that, you know, I was on a personal development workshop uh, a few years ago and I remember feeling quite angry and I remember somebody saying to me, Ian, your anger is welcome here. And it was like, (laughs) (laughs) like, what? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Last time someone said that to me, I got arrested. But, and that's the thing, isn't it? Like they cultivated an environment where I was able to be with myself, no matter what that meant. Mm -hmm. They weren't intimidated by that. And that's the starting point. How do we how do we cultivate environments where people can be with themselves, regardless of what they need to be with? We cannot set a condition. You know, it has to be what they bring. And for me, that's the beginning. So and it, and, 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 and how we do that is with positive messages. And the, the, the workshops that I deliver, I, I ask people at the beginning their name role and I ask them how they're feeling. Tell me how you're feeling. I want to know what the the emotional energy is happening in this, you know, virtual platform. And people often say anxious, stressed, you know, because I'm I'm supporting foster carers who are, you know, not always tech savvy, have just rushed back from a school run or contending with children in lockdown or, you know, a world of things as well as a global pandemic. So, you know, and when people say I'm anxious, I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm frustrated or all those feelings, I say, you know what, that anxiety is welcome here bring that it is welcome and we can contain it and that's the starting point yeah and even hearing you say that makes it's funny it makes me feel really comfortable because it's when you're around people that have created an environment both in themselves and the environment you're in that you can be with yourself you 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 get the best out of people whether that's a work environment whether that's around you know when you know if I'm working with young people and you know say say someone's got a tick and you know they're twitching or whatever. Actually, the second that you just think that's all right, you don't worry about it. Like it, it or, or yeah, if that's what you need to do, you, you go do that. Like you need to go smoke, go smoke. Like I'm not saying go and smoke, but it's that. And and what it yeah. does is it, it just it just goes. Oh, I'm, we're here for you, and and you can you can settle and you can be with yourself, and you don't have to be yeah. that. Put this front on, um, which does obviously make you feel vulnerable because I guess that's protected you a lot of the time. But I think what my point is 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 that yeah, it does it no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, to be able to be in an environment where you can be with yourself is massive, isn't it? And um, yeah, I- um, Authenticity, I just have... isn't it? Yeah, I, I, and yeah. I think when I was younger, I think I was probably less authentic. And I mean, that's a, that maybe a, a symptom of- <laughs> Well, we all- Yeah, that's what I mean. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to fit in, you're trying to find your, yeah. your place. And whether or not by trying to fit in is you, not fitting in you end up not fitting in with other people that's kind of the, mm. the way that kind of goes and um actually when you do start to become to go this is me and it's almost that acceptance like you said i think going back to acceptance of acceptance of suffering and acceptance of death but the moment you just accept you can learn to accept the the trauma or whatever's happened in your life or who you are and obviously i think for our carers and, and anybody it's um it's creating that environment we, we do some um, talking to a, <coughs> a clinical therapist about like brainstem calming boxes. So, you know, you've got a kid that's all like heightened and, and super anxious and you've got this and that going on. And by just accepting that and going, OK, yeah, well, when 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 I'm angry, I use these things and stuff that's going to stimulate your brain in a certain way because you're not fighting against it saying, no, 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 you must calm down. You need to calm down. You need to do this. It's like, OK, let's work with it. Actually, let me let me absorb that with whatever we're going to work with rather than putting up the you know the wall of um you know you need to yeah. sort, sort this <laughs> it's a very good yeah, yeah 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 and it's because and it's important to distinguish the difference between the behavior and the feeling right because the behavior is often an expression of the feeling and mm-hmm. and i think that you know while well, like you know what you, you you're setting fires that is welcome here too like you know <laughs> <laughs> you know we must we what must make this? a dis- <laughs> yeah we must make a distinction between the two 
you know, but but you know, you're contending with compulsions to set fires. What's that about? Let's explore that because that's welcome. We'll hold those feelings, you know. Yeah, uh, not that I'm an expert in supporting people that set fires, by the way. Um, my only experience is that I set a couple myself as a child. But, you know, it's it's that's just one example that came to mind. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've had young people that have um, maybe, um, I don't know, have got issues with, like, hacking other kids or, or whatever, like online. And actually, it's acknowledging and saying, that's not OK. But what you have got is an incredible eye and insight for technology so how could we work with that you know why don't we teach you computer programming you know why don't we use the skills yeah. that you've got and, and actually not just say right we're going to take all your technology away and you're never using that anymore it's actually what can we do to kind of show you that you we need to re-guide your your abilities um and then you know if anyone annoys me i can get you to hack them for me um yeah. so so I want to I want to almost not box those things off that we've spoken about but I want to I want to look like at the future um all, all along the more recent future and obviously you have um you were a BASW patron R Baswa 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 <laughs> I'm terrible with acronyms mate so um yeah. how did that come about and what what did that involve yeah so Baswa is the British Association of Social Work um, they are a strong advocate for social work. And I think social work is, uh, you know, often misrepresented in, in the mainstream public and, and don't get a great deal of good press. Um, and I think that that's because bad news travels very fast. And, and most people hear about what social workers should have done when, you know, they didn't do it based on the back of serious case reviews um, and don't hear about all the great practice daily. And the Basra are a, a charity that offer a subscription to social workers to become a member and with that become a world of benefits. So they're a strong advocate for social work practice. And just through being on the scene, really, um, you know, I mean, I did a TED talk, which gives you a bit of kudos, um, you know, and, and, and just sort of like being a, an advocate of people. And, and, and I'm a believer in, in social work. I think that social work is, uh, you know, a wonderful profession that, that stands alone that where governments and agencies subscribe to, 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 you know, meet the needs of people. And for me, so saying I'm a social worker, I hope conveys a message that I care about human rights, human dignity, respect, you know, community, being common unity. Um, and, and I want to advocate for the interests and well-being of people across the board and, 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 and lift marginalized groups and support people who are on the crisp of society to, to, to have, the, the, the choices and freedoms that, that you know the mainstream enjoy so um that's why i'm really passionate about social work and i recognize that that gets lost in translation and there's a world of you know um intricacies that go on in terms of sy systemically and, and 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 sort of structurally but fundamentally that's what social work is for me and that's why i subscribe to it and, and so when Baz were asked me if I would be a patron and advocate for their cause, I was most honoured. And uh, that's been going on a few years now. And I think that role comes to an end soon. Um, so, so, yeah, it's been, an, it's been a really real privilege to, to be a part of Baz. And I've got to work with some amazing people, some amazing academics, Siobhan McLean, uh, Lena Dominelli, you know, these are sort of big writers, you know, in social work education. Um, you know, I've been on Victoria Darby's show a couple of times with them, uh, Lord Laming and, you know, a few sort of politicians and stuff. And uh, some politicians that are probably a little bit less inspiring, if I'm honest. But, you know, nonetheless, I got to work with them. So, you know, it's um, it's been a real, real, real journey. With I really enjoyed it. Could you imagine if you had a 12, little 12 year old here being told that this is the change that you're going to affect for so many other people? <sighs> I mean... You know, I've had another moment like that recently. Um, uh, so last week I met with a deputy minister for the Maldives government. And, you and think, mate, that's you know, a pretty standard week. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and they've asked me if I'd look at, you know, we're, we're having discussions about their national drug strategy and policy and, and in terms of adolescence. So, you know, we're trying to, I'm trying to develop that relationship at the moment and see if I can, 
trained some practitioners in the Maldives and and I already uh, offered I, I, did, I delivered a, a workshop on um, child protection and adolescence to 30 child protection social workers in the Maldives I mean this is the great thing about this technological revolution you know I've, in my international role, I was delivering loads of stuff like that. It was just so much fun, you know, and the connections we can make now with a with a push of a button. But but yeah, so going back to your statement, like the 12-year-old Ian, it, I didn't know there was another way to live, Ed. That's where all my life had got to. And if there was, it wasn't possible for someone like me. Yeah. And that was the rhetoric that I lived with as a result of the belief systems. Role models are so important, mate, I think, as well. I think that yeah. that's... That, I think um, because when... Um, when you talk about role models for, for care leavers, um, when we, we've, in the past, we've looked, when I first came into social work, we I looked at who are role models for care leavers? Who looks, or anybody really, but let's focus on that is, who looks like me? Who has gone through similar things to me and what can I aspire to be? And sometimes what gets rolled out is people that are non-attainable, people that you have no connection to. People always roll, you know, they talk about, um, the guy from Men Behaving Badly <laughs> was in foster care and Steve Jobs, who spent a real brief time in it before being adopted. Now, that's not, you know, every kid that I have ever worked with and cared for. I think it's about attainable role models who are like who are real people for kids. And also and I think and actually that doesn't necessarily mean you need to be directly working with the kid, but working with the foster carers as well, that they can see actually, do you know what? There is a future for them. Um, there is something that that we can do and I think that's why the stuff that you're doing and people like you are is is so important because it's it's real um like you said you didn't know there was another world out there you didn't you just thought that maybe you know well I've been told these things so I'm going to spend my life in prison um thank god that you know your your solicitor um you know had those conversations with you yeah 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 Yeah, like completely uh, I mean you know I am extremely lucky to be where I am and have had all the wonderful experiences that I have and to the point where I'm grateful for the the, the, the adversity too, you know, and, and I've turned my pain into purpose, you know, and um, I mean, I speak to a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of people in recovery and over the years and, you know, I mean, not long ago I met a lad, you know, at a recovery support group who was 19 and he was detoxing from heroin. And, and I said to him, you know, I said, listen, I come into these rooms when I was 20, 21. And I said, you know, I'm 35 now and, and, and I've, I've stayed in recovery and I haven't gone back to prison. And there's been a bit of relapse along the way. But, you know, at the end of this month, I'll be eight, eight years abstinence based recovery, God willing. And, and I said to him, you know, if you stick with this, you've got a wonderful life ahead of you. I said, I've had a fantastic career. I've been all around the world. I've met some amazing people. I've eaten in some of the best restaurants there are, you know, and and I, I've done all of that about getting off my head, you know, and, and I have an app to be enslaved to addiction throughout that. Uh, I mean, I've battled with addiction, you know, because it's not just about taking drugs and drinking, it's other stuff too. But, you know, but generally speaking, I've managed to sort of stick stick with it. And, and you know, and, and, and I could feel the goosebumps come over my body as I was telling him that because... I remember saying to somebody, uh, I said to this guy in AA once, you know, I said, oh, they're all old in AA. And he just looked at me and he says, how do you think they got old, Ian? And, and that's never left me. Yeah. And, and he said, one day someone will walk into these rooms and they'll say they'll be young and they'll need to hear from somebody who's done it from a young age. So, you know, I'm immensely grateful for that. And, uh, you know, my hope is that that young lad will grow into a beautiful human being more so than he already is. And then pass that, pay that forward. And it's about that community, isn't it? Of just people like carrying the message because it is about the message and not the messenger. You know, I'm just a human being who's guilty of being on a journey, but this isn't exclusive to me. Yeah. You know, this is, this has to be available for other people. And it, it's important we don't get lost in that. Oh, he's so powerful. He's so strong. He's so inspirational. Yeah. Like I am a human being with qualities because I've never met a person in my life that doesn't have any good qualities. But ultimately, I am a human being that's, that can advocate that other human beings can do that too. It, this ain't about me. This is about the message. And, and, and you know, I'm just, uh, I hope, delivering it with some <laughs> influence, you know. But, but yeah, so it, that's how we have to see people. It's about how, how are we choosing to see people, you know. 
and what we promote is what we attract. Well, you said that you hoped that <laughs> he grew into a beautiful human being and without trying to shoot your ego, mate, you've absolutely, from all the conversations we've had, you've definitely grown into like a beautiful human being, mate. That as Thanks, to, to, to be in that perspective where you are doing those things and giving back into the, the culture and the lifestyle and everything that, that has gone on and, you know, and made a successful career out of it. And who, like you said, mate, who would have thought you'd be training social workers in the <laughs> and, and, yeah. it, and it's And it's, but it's, it's the impact that has on other people. We've, we've had got staff that have done some work with um, the social work teams in Uganda from the Child's Eye Foundation, because historically they used to just have um, orphanages and they've had a real shift towards foster care because of the, the, the importance of kids growing up in a family. And I've seen the benefits of that from talking to them. And like you say, mate, everything that you're doing and giving, putting things back into the foster care system, it's making it a better place, mate, I think. I, honestly, I can't wait for our carers to be able to have some time with you on a training yeah. so that they can go, okay, like, and just give them those, those, those nuggets that they can add into their, like, toolbox, which... Because some of it, you might not even know that you need it until all of a sudden you're presented with that situation. You're like, there it is. There's Ian's voice in my head. <laughs> That's what I need to do. And, and that, I know I've, I've, I've written things down in front of me the whole time we're talking. And there's been like, there's been a couple of things that you've really sort of said. And one of them is, um, I know it's going back to the word beautiful, but it is true. It, it's, I, just, man, I don't know what it is, mate. It's the way that you've said it or something. It's that like being comfortable and, and, and being present and being with 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 ourselves it's i don't know it's sticking to me head mate i need to go and do some like meditating or something i think i need to try i need to try my mindfulness again um i, I think really i i know that when you talk about what what's your sort of like creative out uh, your creative output so i know that you've done poetry and stuff is is that is that something that you have always done or is it something that you have just given it a shot at do you know what I mean? What is it like? Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I used to MC back in the day on the rave scene, you know, uh, into some local establishments near you, actually, funny yeah. enough. Um, you know, and, and um, yeah, and, 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 and I guess, um, you know, some of that was inspired by, you know, copious amounts of ecstasy. And, and when I kind of, you know, gave up all of that stuff. I, I sort of stayed on the scene for a bit and did some promoting, but my lyrics evolved really into stuff that was sort of more meaningful. Um, I say more me, I mean, you know, being in a nightclub off your head, you know, may be meaningful to some, uh, but but less meaningful to me than it used to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, yeah, so I guess I, I wrote, I mean, I wrote a poem we could probably link it with this it's on youtube um called we are social workers for world social work month it's on youtube um you know and 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 kind of i hope that i conveyed a message about what social work is within that and i think that um words are really powerful and i just like the fact that i can express myself and communicate and read and write and and sometimes, you know, I write gratitude. Well, every morning I, I, I aim to write a gratitude list, you know, because I think that um, gratitude is attitude, right? And then, you know, in the mornings I write gratitude and sometimes I write them on my phone and I send them to my friends and hopefully they'll write one back or I'll just write it in a journal. And, and you know, on that is always I'm grateful that I can read and write. I'm grateful that I can communicate, you know, and, and so... For me, um, it, it, the outlet is that it allows me to express myself, you know, and I, and I can express parts of me that for so long couldn't be expressed. Mm. And, and I'm immensely grateful for that. So, yeah, it is an outlet. You're completely right. And, and yeah. I think, that, um, I think that's why a lot, of, a lot of work with young people, you find that I've, I've definitely found that so many young people that I've worked with have got just there's a create, there's something in them in terms of creativity of, it's just such a, a handy outlet. It doesn't matter whether you, you're the, yeah. you know, the best drawer or the best writer. It's We've done quite a, a bit of work with a guy called Rick Flo, who was a care leaver who, um, of, of music production and writing and expressing your mental health through like through rhyme and stuff. And I've just always, wow. found it's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's just been a really good tool to, to get people talking. 
And and like you said, it doesn't have to necessarily be this big thing. It can be your gratitude and, and actually learning to articulate those thoughts and feelings, you know, so you can look back on it. And I love the idea of sharing it with other people and saying, this is what I'm grateful for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's the bit. It's the sharing, isn't it? And, yeah, yeah. I love um, that. Well, listen, mate. I'm incredibly grateful that you've given up your time um, to talk to us today. Um, Ian, you've got um, you've got your own website. Is that right as well? Where people, if people want to, no, I have. <laughs> How? No, 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 no. I, I, I've been thinking about creating one just because I've got so many publications and yeah. stuff now that where, where do I land all of this stuff? Yeah. You know and. Um, but but that's something that I should probably think about and and maybe look at financing or getting some help with. But but yeah. But I mean, look, I'm on Twitter at Ian Presents. Um, I'm I'm on Facebook, Ian Thomas, and I'm on LinkedIn. So yeah, and maybe we can put the links to those yeah, socials. Yeah, it'll, it'll be all be underneath because this will be on YouTube, so it'll be all underneath. And if you're listening to it on Podbean or um, iTunes or Spotify, um, that'll all be underneath there as well. So you can you can check out Ian and. Um, yeah, and like I say, for anybody that's in Blue Sky, we're going to be having some training coming up with Ian to look at some of the things you've spoken about today and helping prepare young people for um, the independent world and what we can do, what the hell you can do and what we can all do to, to support people. Um, listen, mate, enjoy the rest of the rest of your day and the beautiful scenery. For anybody who is um, just listening, you haven't seen it. I've seen it. It's beautiful. Um, at the moment, I'm in my hallway, so it's not quite the same view. Um, so I think I'm going to go for a walk. Um, thank you ever so much again, Ian. Um, and I hope everybody... No worries. Cheers, dude. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, guys. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.